Hi, welcome to Good Hope Church. I'm Pastor Mike. I'm glad you are joining us today. Welcome to our service. Today we'll be going over This Is Love, Part 4. And I just want to uh, encourage you, if you are able to make a comment uh, on YouTube or social media, if you're able to share this content, I would love it if you would do that. I really, really appreciate that. Helps get the word out there. Also, now is our time where we enter into worship, so the worship team has some songs ready for us. And if you're uh, in your living room by yourself, you know, now we're starting to gather with smaller groups and stuff, which is all kinds of fun, but if you're in your living room and it just feels a little weird, I encourage you, just take this time to connect with God. However you need to do that, just take some special time to connect with God in worship.
for that life that is truly life, life overflowing and abundant that we can have through you. Hallelujah.
Good to worship the Lord. Amen. What a blessing it is to have the team that we have from the the people on stage to the people behind the scenes. I'm so thankful and blessed to have the team we have, and I hope you were able to have a great time of worshiping the Lord. Uh, Now's the time in each service where we focus on online giving and also kids church. So again, if you are able to see the little eye up there, then that'll take you to online giving and to our kids church video. I love watching the kids church videos. They've been so much fun. And also, uh, if you're able to participate with giving online in that way, I appreciate that. If that doesn't work, just go to goodhope.ag. That will get you everything you need for online giving and for the kids church video and if you'd rather just write a letter our church's address physical address is 55 armory road cloquet minnesota 55720 so we've had a good number of people writing letters and that's been so so cool very heartwarming so thank you for that 55 armory road cloquet well pastor Corey from our morgan park campus is going to share our one minute blessing with us today so Thank you, Pastor Mike. Again, my name is Pastor Corey uh, here today, and we're going to get ready to do our one-minute blessing. And something that was on my heart, I just want to pray for um, our perspective, you know, through this whole situation and the duration of how long this has been and what we've faced. Sometimes as we face situations like this, and, and for that amount of time, our perspective can be affected and our perspective can change. And so what I want to pray for is that we would uh, have a perspective from God, that we would have a a heavenly perspective through this situation. And so let's take this time to pray. Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for all that you're doing, Lord. And as we've walked through this uh, pandemic and this situation and the duration of how long it has been, Lord, and, and how life has changed, God, that this can just have an effect on, on our perspective and the way we see things sometimes. And so, Lord, I just, I pray right now, God, that we would uh, just get your perspective, Lord. God, you are good. And God, you have good plans. And sometimes when our perspective changes, it can, it can have an effect on our expectation as well. And so today, Lord, I pray that you would just come, that you would just speak to our hearts, God, that you would give us a heavenly perspective uh, during this time and, and a perspective, Lord, that comes directly from you. And so, Lord, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for all that you want to do, all that you are doing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Corey, for leading us in prayer Let's keep our perspective right, trusting in the Lord, however long, whatever the process is, let's trust the Lord. All right, we are going to continue our series, This is Love, again, part four. Uh, We've been covering a bunch of important things about the love of God, you know, it's just by way of recap. Love is a foundational and indispensable part of Christianity. Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. That's the most important uh, commandment. And Jesus added the second, and that is something that all the law and the prophets hang on. So love is foundational and indispensable for Christianity. And something will always be missing in your faith, in your life, without love, without understanding the love of God. You won't truly understand the gospel and the ways of God. So we need to seek this out. We need to go grab hold of the love of God, understand God's love for us, and uh, learn to love other people, go through that process. Last time we talked about loving your neighbor. That's uh, the broadcast love for humanity in general, loving all those people. Today, we're going to talk about loving one another. Uh, In the scriptures, there are many times where we are commanded to love our fellow followers of Jesus, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's different from loving your neighbor in that we share our faith together with one another, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are to love one another. So let's pray, and we will get into that new material here today. So Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, that you haven't just left us alone to try to do the best we can, 
but Lord, you guide us. Thank you for guiding us by your Holy Spirit, and thank you for guiding us by your Holy Word. Help us to grab hold of today what your scriptures have for us. Help us to see. Lord, each one of us is dealing with different things. We've got different obstacles, different uh, different barriers in our life that we need to break through, things we need to overcome. So Father, I pray by your Spirit that you would meet each one of us right where we're at with just what we need. Lord, bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So love one another. In John chapter 13, Jesus uh, makes this very, very clear. John 13 verses 34 and 35, Jesus says this, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So here we see Jesus give a command that has a result. He tells his followers, his disciples, to love one another, and then he shows what the result will be. So let's look at that command. Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. He says he is the example for how we are to love each other, how he has loved us. So the question is, how has Jesus loved you? How has Jesus loved me? Jesus loved us while we were still sinners and died for us that we could be saved, set free, and brought into the family of God. He is patient with us, works with us, understands our failures and faults, and is there for us anyway, as he has loved us. So we are to love one another. What an amazing, amazing command to love each other as Jesus has loved us. That's the command, and there's a must in there. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Little extra emphasis. We are absolutely commanded to love one another, fellow believers in Jesus, the way Jesus has loved us. And then there's a result. The result here, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The result is an impact on other people, on those outside the faith, on those who aren't the disciples loving one another. But it says, again, by this, everyone will know. It will have an impact on showing everyone something important about who God is. So the result is that everyone will know that you are my disciples, as opposed to what? Everybody thinking that you're religious weirdos or just angry, goofed up people, that sort of a thing. But if we love one another, then people will see that we are followers of God that are working together. So here's something. I am convinced the single most powerful tool we have for evangelism, for bringing the truth and the goodness of God to this world, the single most powerful tool we have for evangelism is simply living the Christian life well together. That's the most powerful thing we can do to evangelize the world is live the Christian life well together. If we can do that, this promise is true. It will show everyone that we are disciples of the one true God. I will, uh, I've said this controversial statement before. I'm going to say it again. I'll say it in the future too. Most people don't need to hear about Jesus. They need to be shown. They need to be shown what following Jesus looks like. They don't need to hear. Too many people have heard about Jesus, but then they've been shown hypocrisy, and that creates a serious problem. That's where we end up in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 verse 24 says, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So if we tell people about Jesus, but then we act hypocritically, it doesn't show everyone that we are his disciples. It makes people look down on God, blaspheme God, think this is all a bunch of baloney. So we need to love one another. We need to live the life well so that then it shows people. Uh, Instead of being hypocritical and constantly failing God and not loving one another, but having division in our midst. Instead of that, 
uh, and that causing people to blaspheme God. Instead, you know, we want to show people who God is by how we're living and how we're living together. And then Matthew 5, 14 through 16 will start to come to pass. This is in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And he's talking, of course, to those who are following him, who are listening to him speak. So those who want to be his disciples, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what causes people to glorify our heavenly Father? The good deeds of the people who are following following Jesus. Uh, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So if we live true to the scriptures, true to the ways of God, then that's going to lead people to praise God. It's going to lead people to understand that we are followers of Almighty God. But if we act in hypocrisy, it's going to cause people to reject God, to blaspheme God, to push away from God, to rebel against God. So we need to love one another. We need to follow the scriptures so that people can be brought close to God. You know, it's not our arguments, our anger at things that are wrong in this world or our superficial coolness, you know, that brings people to Christ. It's us living the life well together. When we do that, it brings people to God. Because who wouldn't want to be part of that group? A group of people that loves each other like Jesus has loved us. Wouldn't you want to have a group of friends like that? Wouldn't you want to have a community like that where everyone loves you like Jesus loves you and that you love others and you have the same heart for them that Jesus has for them? What an amazing group of people that would be to be part of. So of course, that beautiful environment would be something that people would be easily added to. But if we've got ugly, divisive, yucky churches that are, are, you know, even hard to become part of, then it's not going to work. We want to love one another because the result will be that it will bring people to God. But here's one of the problems. Here's one of the problems. It's easier to be somebody's friend than somebody's roommate. Have you noticed that? It's easier to be a friend than a roommate. And that's because the closer you get to someone, the more that their faults are magnified and the positive things seem to fade. The closer you get to someone, the more challenging the relationship becomes. That's just part of reality. Uh, You know, I'm married. I've been married for a long time now. Uh, What year is it? 2020. So it'll be 29 years uh, next month that I'll have been married. And let me tell you, it is easier to have a girlfriend than it is to have a wife. Right? Like the closer the relationship gets, the more challenging it is. So it's the same way with the body of Christ. You know, love your neighbor. We talked about last time. Love that person you don't really know and, you know, uh, buy him some food or, you know, sponsor a child in another country or these sorts of things. Love your neighbor, do that stuff. Well, that's easy to do, but if you actually got to know them, you got close with them, you'd see their faults, you'd see their failures. You wouldn't just see their need and your heart would go out, but you'd see the things they do wrong. You would see uh, the, the yuck in their heart and all those sorts of things that everybody has. You would see that and you'd start to focus on their faults and the, the positives would start to fade. So it's a challenge because the closer you get to someone, the more difficult the relationship is to maintain. So we need to get really good at following Jesus for this to work, to love one another. And this is where many Christians stumble. And in today's world, it's very common for somebody to be a, uh, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a Christian, I don't go to church. I mean, those people are goofy. Uh, And 
So they have missed the love one another part. They love God, but the love one another, because it's very challenging. You know, there's people are, you know about people. Uh, it's challenging. But we are called to love one another as Jesus has loved us. Does Jesus love the challenging people? Absolutely. He loved me. Very challenging. He, he's someone who does that. We need to extend that to one another. So how do we do that? How do we love one another? This is a, this is a serious challenge. And, and it's not something to just skip lightly over and think, oh, yeah, 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 I'll go do that. Because, again, you've got to get into that close relationship. The family of God includes, of course, people all around the world, but it includes close relationships with people where you end up having friction because of the closeness. And it is more difficult than maintaining a relationship that's more distant. So how do we do this? How do we love one another? How do we engage in community and do life together without splintering apart? I'm going to give you four steps, four things that you can do to help you love your fellow believer in Jesus. So step one, know your target. Know what you're trying to do. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But before we get there, I want to talk about this church in Corinth. They had significant problems. They had lots of issues. So we're going to read some preliminary verses from 1 Corinthians before we get to chapter 13. And uh, that'll show you where they're at because they were starting to falter on the love one another part because divisions were cropping up inside the church. People were starting to uh, silo into different groups. They didn't like each other. They had lawsuits against each other. There's lots of, lots of problems going on there. But let's just read a few sections from early in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 says this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and there will be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? Add an extra verse there, verse 13. Is Christ divided? Well, in the spirit, no. On the earth, among God's people, yes. We should try to grab hold of the spiritual truth that Christ is not divided. That there is one God and Father of all and one body with many parts. Christ is not divided, but we live, the body of Christ, the people of God, live divided. That was cropping up in the church in Corinth. Some wanted to follow Peter. Some wanted to follow Apollos. Others wanted to follow Paul. They were siloing. Some were like, I'm not following any of them. I just follow Jesus straight to the source. You know, uh, Christ is not divided, but division was creeping in. Then chapter three, this topic comes up again. Brothers and sisters, Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? You know, people say, well, I'm just a man, just a man, I'm just a man, I'm just a person. Well, we're supposed to be the children of God. We're supposed to be walking by the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God, not just a normal person, a worldly person. We're not supposed to be quarreling and fighting and have jealousy among us. But this was happening in the church. And how serious is this? Verses 16 and 17 of that same chapter, chapter 3, this is so harsh. Paul says to the church there, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? So you yourselves, the plural, the group is the temple of God. Now the temple is the people of God. Verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So the people who bring division 
in the, the body of Christ among the believers, here it says that God will destroy that person. That's very, very strong. But it's so important that we love one another that when people go against that and there's divisions and quarreling and jealousy and that love one another starts to go away, that the temple is described as destroying God's temple, breaking apart the people of God. Very, very important. We need to take this very, very seriously because basically it ruins that Matthew 5, the, you know, the city on a hill that People will see your good deeds and they'll praise your Father in heaven. It ruins that whole thing because people see that the church and then they think, what a bunch of goofballs. And it, it messes it all up. Instead of bringing people to God, it pushes people away from God because they're repulsed by our failure to follow the ways of God. So what are the ways of God? The ways of God, the ways of love are described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And one of the most amazing and profound things about 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is that it is between 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is talking about spiritual gifts, how there's one body in many parts, all these different types of people serving God together. So we need to function together, even though we're very different. And then chapter 14 is talking about specific ways of behaving in church services that can cause friction and division and difficulties among church people. So in the midst of all the differences of the followers of Christ and how to do, uh, you know, how to uh, use those differences in a church service, uh, what the benefit of each different person's giftings are, in between that you see 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is talking about how to love one another, how Christians are to love other Christians. It's not, I mean, it can be used in a marriage thing or something like that, but this is talking about believer to believer, brothers and sisters in Christ, how they treat brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to do the last half of the last verse of chapter 12 and then read through chapter 13. And yet I will show you the most excellent way If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. And where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. But now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So we see your abilities, your skills, the accomplishments that you've done in the beginning of the chapter mean nothing if you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a description of what love is and what love isn't, and then continues in the rest of the chapter saying, so don't worry so much about your abilities, your spiritual gifts, your accomplishments. Those things are temporary, but what will last is faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of those is love. So we need to know the target, and the target is to love one another the way 1 Corinthians chapter 13 describes us. Not delighting in evil, rejoicing in the truth, protecting, trusting, hoping, persevering, never failing. That is how we are to love one another. So that's our target. 
Our target is to love each other like Christ has loved us. A perfect description in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, an expansion of what Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another, described there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So step one, know your target. Step two, fix your eyes. That is, resist the temptation to focus on and magnify faults while forgiving the, forgetting the positive things. So resist the temptation to magnify faults and at the same time, don't forget the positives. So Hebrews chapter 12, very important section. Someday maybe we'll do a series on this called Fix Your Eyes. But Hebrews 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such great opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So we want to focus on what Jesus has done for us. Fix our eyes on the Lord instead of on the faults of the people around us, on the faults of our brothers and sisters, what they could be doing differently, what they could be doing better. Let's focus on Jesus, what he's done for us, and then let's try to help out. Don't magnify faults. Think of what Jesus endured at the hands of sinners, it says, and let's work together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then Matthew 7, 3 through 5, that's where Jesus says, why do you look at the speck of dust in your brother's eye while in the meantime you've got a plank in your own eye? First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So instead of looking at the faults of other people, now Jesus instructs us to look at ourselves, to figure out what we need to change, what we need to do better. So we fix our eyes by focusing on the Lord, what he's done for us and how he persevered through difficulty. And then when we notice something wrong with somebody else, we look at ourselves and try to get the plank out of our own eye. So fix our eyes by focusing on Jesus, focusing on our own self-improvement by looking at making ourselves better and serve the Lord more effectively. And then uh, Philippians 4.8 says this. Let's get there quick. It's uh, all about your mental focus. Philippians 4.8, which is in the context of church strife, uh, church conflict. Two ladies were quarreling with each other. There was some kind of a difficulty there. Paul describes them as people who have contended at his side in the cause of the gospel. So these are strong followers of Jesus who are active in some sort of ministry. And in that context, the apostle Paul tells them, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So Paul is telling them to magnify the positives, magnify the good things about one another. Don't focus on the faults of one another, but magnify the good things about one another. So we want to fix our eyes. Again, step one, know your target, love one another as Christ has loved you. Description in 1 Corinthians 13. And then fix your eyes. Resist the temptation to magnify faults, but instead bring up the positives. Fix your eyes by focusing on what Jesus and what he endured, what Jesus has done and what he has endured. Fix your eyes by, instead of focusing on other people's uh, faults, things they could do better. Instead, deal with yourself. Take the plank out of your own eye. And then whatever is good, whatever is noble, all those good things, think about those things instead of letting your mind wander and rehearse over and over the negative things. Then step three, get good at forgiving. 
So again, step one, know your target. Step two, fix your eyes. Step three, get good at forgiving. How did Jesus love us again? Uh, By forgiving us of our sins. We need to be good at forgiving. This should become normal, everyday, no big deal sort of thing for us where we forgive one another. In Luke chapter 17, there's a section of scripture that doesn't get read all that often. Uh, The first part is read, but the last part, not very often. So I want to read Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke 17, 1 through 10. We're going to talk about forgiving our brothers and sisters. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck neck, than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So Jesus is telling his disciples, that they need to be be forgiving people over and over again. And they're thinking, that's hard. You know, forgiving once is tough. Forgiving twice is really hard. Imagine three times, four, five, six. Um, That's hard to do. So they said, increase our faith. And Jesus tells this. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So what is the point there? Uh, That's Not super exciting, kind of has a little negative feel to it. But what's Jesus trying to say? He's saying, look, don't expect a party when you forgive. This is normal, everyday stuff. You've got to get to the place where you can forgive people. Just boom, get it done. It's your duty. You just do it. Don't expect a party. It's not a huge deal. Just get real good at forgiving people. Something that we're expected to do. So again, step three, get good at forgiving. And then step four, the last step here that I'll give you, is get good at not needing to be forgiven. That's another important piece of the puzzle. It's not about all of us forgiving each other as we wrong one another over and over and over and over again. This should start to become very rare, where you actually wrong somebody, uh, where you actually start, uh, where you're hurting people. So we need to be good at not needing to be forgiven all the time. You know, this is something in our Christian culture, I think is really important to understand. We do need to be making progress in this area. You know, there's Christian music, different songs, you know, things like that. The, the reality is, uh, if we fail, it does matter. It hurts people. It does damage. It's a problem. So we need to get good at not needing to be forgiven all the time. Now, if you know, mo- if you know my story... Um, I didn't understand love one another when I was a new Christian. I spent seven years really not loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. I looked down on other believers. I thought they were doing a bad job of following Jesus. I thought uh, pastors and leaders were doing a bad job of, of steering the church to the things of God, but they were, they were doing other things. And I just wasn't very good at loving one another. Um, but now I get it. Now I understand. It isn't about our brothers and sisters in Christ being perfect and so they earn our love. It's about us loving one another like Jesus has loved us so that it lifts them up, so that they grow and are changed. So we need to love each other, not based on the merit of each other, but in order to extend something to each other that helps us to grow and become who God created us to be. So the love of God doesn't condemn us, but brings us up. And when we love one another, it doesn't condemn us, but brings us up. It's Very, very important that we don't love each other because of the merits of each other, 
but we love each other out of obedience to God to bring each other up. Now, this is the first weekend of the month, and so I want to encourage you to have communion. If you're meeting in a small group, watching the service together, I encourage you to have communion together. Uh, You can do that by yourself or in a group, but I want to encourage you to take communion together, and I want to read uh, a scripture from John chapter 15 that we've read before, but it ties into the love God has for us and how we're to love one another. John 15 verses 12 and 13, Jesus says, my command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So Jesus showed the love he had for his disciples by going to the cross and sacrificing, paying the price, the wages of sin is death. Jesus paid the price that we could be released from that debt and set free. So Jesus died on the cross to set us free. Also, if you I had a request for giving some scripture references to take communion to, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 is a great example. This is a very important description of communion. And of course, we read a lot of scriptures from 1 Corinthians today. And the context of that is paying attention to one another loving each other. Don't go ahead and eat while other people are hungry. Don't act a fool. It's about loving one another. So read chapter 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, and you can read the rest of the context and tie it into the message if you'd like. But I encourage you to receive communion. Remember, uh, his body was broken for us for our healing. By his stripes, we are healed. And his blood was shed for our forgiveness. So we can receive healing and forgiveness through communion. So uh, if you've been listening to these services, you've been here today, and you haven't given your life to Christ, I want to do an email altar call. When we're together, we have people raise hands, and I just love that part of the service. People come and and they they give their lives to Christ. They proclaim their faith in Jesus. Uh, We can't do the hand raising, but You can shoot me an email. Raise your hand by shooting me an email, letting you know that you want to give your life to Christ, and I will help you do that. So uh, shoot me an email. There's our email altar call. So let's pray together as we close the service. Let's pray that every Christian can follow Christ by loving each other. Let's do that. If you've got a prayer need, prayer at goodhope.ag. Prayer team will pray for that prayer need. But let's pray together to be able to love one another. So Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us the way, the most excellent way, the way of love, where we love one another, where we are that city on a hill, that light on the lampstand that brings light to the whole room, Lord, that we are an example to this world of how you want people to live, loving one another, helping each other, fixing their eyes on you, understanding that the target is the love you have for us and being able to forgive, not having a a huge process, but just able to forgive and then not messing things up, not needing to be forgiven all the time. Lord, let us walk in your ways. Let us trust in you and Lord, help us. Father, I pray for those who are part of churches that have division and strife and harshness going on that are are still separated because of the COVID-19 deal, but will be coming back together. Lord, I pray that when they come back together, that they would come together strong, knowing that we love each other, not because of the merit of each other, but because, Lord, you have loved us and that love has changed us. So we love one another so that, that we can be changed and lifted up. Lord, encourage us, give us strength, give us that love by your Holy Spirit so that we can walk in your ways. Bless us and encourage us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, so glad you were here with us. Again, if you could share on social media or make a comment, that'd really be super helpful. Uh, But if you can't, that's cool too. 
But I just want to say thank you for being part of this. And from all of us here at Good Hope, God bless. Mm-hmm.